right, so that's up. Okay, so what we'll do today is to look at the implementation of another subroutine. Okay, so hopefully that will help uh, us understand, you know, how to get things done. Um, one thing that we haven't really touched in this class is recursion. So we're going to do some recursion, um, you know, in this class. And if we have time left, you know, then I'll go uh, basically crack one of my own programs. Okay. So if you go here, it might or might not be here. Let me see if it's still here or not. Because sometimes I forget to put it back into here. Do, 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 do. So it may not be here anymore. You know, I have to go dig up that program. It's just an executable without the source file. So I have to basically use just the executable, which are basically the zeros and ones, the opcodes and whatnot, and GDB to help you know, kind of crack that program to do something that it's not supposed to. So. If we get enough time, we can get we can uh, try that. All right. So the first thing we'll do is we will implement a well-known string function. Um, in the Monday Wednesday class, I did string length. So in this class, I'm going to string do. Okay, you guys can choose string copy or string compare. Pick one. String compare. Okay. So we'll do string compare. So the first thing we need to do is to figure out what string compare does and what it returns and stuff like that. So you know, looking up the man page here quickly, you'll know, find out exactly what your know, string compare does. It has two parameters. Um, S1 is string one, S2 is string two. So they're both basically pointers to chars. And the string compare function compares the two strings. It returns an integer that is less than, equal to, or greater than, depending on whether S1 is less than, match or equal to or greater than S2. Okay? So and I'm not gonna do string and compare, which is recommended that you use the length delimited version. So I'm just gonna do string compare um, because it's a little bit simpler, but I'm gonna do it in a recursive way. Okay? So are there any questions about what we are going to do at least for the first part of the class? It depends on how long this takes. If it doesn't take long enough, we can go ahead and you know, try to crack the other program. If this one takes up all the, the entire class, then we won't have time to kind of crack the other program. <coughs> is that okay? All right. So the first thing we need to do is to look into the source code in C and C++, make sure that works, and then we'll try to convert it into assembly. Now, the C version you know, uh, is going to be interesting because not only is it usef useful to verify that the program is working correctly, but it also gives us a chance to use GDB and backtrace in GDB to really graphically or visually show how recursion really works. And it will be very clear that each invocation has its own parameters on the stack. You know, so we'll, we'll get to that part. All right. So let me go to the temp folder. And you know, I you know, reset the computer so everything is gone at this point, which is good. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, start writing the code. Um, let's see, it's string cmp.c, and I'm going to turn off the stage lighting. And let's do one that's on. Hmm. There we go. Okay, so the contrast is better. <clears throat> so we'll do a pound include um, stdint.h, standard integer.h. Uh, so that way we can use um, int and stuff like that. So int underscore t, you know, because I want to keep everything to be 8-bit wide, uh, string compare. Um, and then the pointers are basically a const, oops, char s1, const char s2. And by the way, uh, because of the positioning of const here, um, s1 itself is a pointer. The pointer itself is not a const. It is what it points to that is a const. In other words, I'm free to change S1, but I cannot change what it points to. Okay? Because you can make it the other way around. You can make it so that the const is between char and the asterisk symbol. So in that case, the pointer itself is const. You cannot change the pointer, but you can change what it points to. Now you can also have two consts, okay? One const the way it is, and then add one more const between char and the asterisk then you cannot change the pointer itself, nor can you change what it points to. Okay? Just little things you know, that you should have picked up in the you know, C, uh, CISP 360, if they teach about you know, the con steel con concept. All right. So I got a few options here. We're going to do it in a recursive way. 
Um, do you guys want to do it in a conditional statement way or do you want to do it in a ternary operator way? Ternary. ternary. Okay. So we only got one person, you know, stating the preference. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Okay, so we'll use the ternary operator, okay? So ternary <coughs> operator goes like this, okay? Depending on some condition, um, if the condition is true, we return the second expression, evaluate and return the second expression, otherwise we evaluate and return the third expression. So it's basically if then else, except we are not dealing with statements, we are dealing with expressions. Okay, so now the question is, what do you think is important here? What condition am I looking at? Yes? I believe so. Let's double check. Oops. Ah, keep missing that. Yep, so we are recording. The voice is active, so that's good. Okay, so the first question is, okay, you can use the then case for the end of recursion, or you can use the else for the end of recursion. I typically, because I'm a, it depends on your bias. If you're a non-lazy person, then your bias is probably going like, okay, tell me when we need to do recursion because you're always kind of leaning to doing more work. But since I'm really lazy, I, my tendency is to lean to the time or the condition that stops the recursion. It's like, okay, when do I have to do nothing? What do you think? We have two strings. Okay, one string is pointed to by S1, one string is pointed to by S2. When can I just say that, oh, we are done, we don't need any recursion. I can tell which string is smaller, larger, or equal to at this point. Yes? They're not the same. Okay, very good, I will buy that. So you can say that um, when this does not equal to that, then we can just return, okay? Now, I'm not saying that when, what we, we're gonna return just yet, but this is one of the ways you can say, okay, we, we can tell the answer right away. We don't have to go any further because what S1 and S2 are pointing to are different. I can tell that the two strings are different. We don't have to go any further. Is that okay? But this is not the only time you can say, okay, we can stop recursion. There's one more thing that you can do to stop recursion. What do you think that is? In other words, I'm going to say, okay, this is one way to do it, um, but there's one more way to do it. So we can say, or, what do you think? So now, you have to kind of think about this in a logic way, because if we, ex if we um, evaluate the right-hand side of the logical or, it means the left-hand side is false already, okay? Because C, has, um, C uses uh, short-circuited evaluation when it comes to logical operators. Yep. because we have hit the end of the string. So if we have hit the null character for both strings, then we can also stop and say, yep, they are the same. Okay, because you, know, you should not explore past the null terminator of a string. So this part is kind of easy because we just have to pick one of them and say, oh, if that is a null character, we can stop. I'm using zero because zero is kind of a universal constant. constant. Um, in this case, the zero would be casted as a char before it is compared. So it's going to be pretty easy. Yep. Why do you have to check only one though? Huh? Check we do not need to check both because of the short circuited nature of logical operators. Because by the time we evaluate the second expression or the right hand side, the first or the left expression has to be false already. So if that is false, that means you know, what S1 points to is the same as what S2 points to. Since they are the same, I just pick one of them and check and if it is a null, that means both of them are null. All right, cool. So now we just have to say, um, if that condition is true, what are we gonna return? And if it is not true, what are we gonna return? So what do you think goes here? Now remember, the description of string compare is to say we have to return a negative value when S1 is less than S2, we return a zero when they are the same, and we return a positive value when S1 is greater than S2. It sounds like we need another ternary operator in here just to do the compare and then specify negative one, zero, and one. Nope, that's way too much work. That's all I need. 
Well, when it says a negative value, it didn't say negative one did it, right? So if S1 is less than S2, then if I subtract whatever S1 points to, excuse me, I take it back. If we subtract whatever S2 points to from whatever S1 points to, it's going to be a negative value. Is it going to be a negative one? No, not necessarily. But do we need it to be a negative one? No. The man page only said something about a negative value. That's all. So this will meet that requirement. What if they're the same? If they're the same, that means whatever S1 points to is the same as whatever S2 points to. And it's going to be 0, too. We know for sure that we won't get here unless S1 and S2 are the same and they're both zeros. Okay, So that works out, too. The subtraction would just give us a 0. What if S1 is greater than S2? Well, the subtraction would be a non-negative value, non-zero. It's going to be a positive integer. So we got it done, too. So this means you know, I don't need any complicated logic at this point to differentiate. Is it less than, does it equal to, or greater than? Okay. Now, I'm pretty sure this is also the reason why string compare um, specifies you know, negative, zero, and greater than zero. You know, as the return values, it's because you know, the actual implementation is also using, using this as a return value. OK. What about the case when we do need to do recursion? In other words, S1 and S2 are pointing to the same, not the same character, but the value they point to are the same. Okay? And they're not known. So that means I cannot differentiate which string is smaller or bigger at this point. So I need to do recursion. So now the question is, one, how do I set up the recursive call? And then two, is once I get the return value from the recursive call, what kind of processing do I need in order to make that my own return value? So there are these two questions that we have to deal with. We'll deal with the first question first. The recursive call itself, how do we set it up? So it's going to be string compare because it's recursive. And since we just compared, whatever S1 points to, to whatever S2 points to, and they are the same, and they are non-null, we go like, well, what about the next character? So we got S1 plus 1 and S2 plus 1. So those are the new pointers that we need to pass to the next invocation or the recursive call. And the good thing is, whatever that returns is going to be what I'm going to return to. Does that make any sense? So I don't need to do any further processing than just saying, OK, whatever this returns is my answer as well. Are we doing OK so far with this recursive subroutine? So what this is really telling you is a string is really a self-similar structure. In other words, you can look at a string as a character plus another string. Okay, You break it apart into something that's small like a character, and then something that has the same structural property as the original problem, which is another string, which is kind of cool. That's how recursion works, is you're breaking down a problem to something that, is, that can be done in one step, and then a sub-problem that has a, uh, a similar you know, structure, so you can use the same subroutine to solve that smaller problem. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and test this. Okay. So we'll have a main here. Um, you, oh, not you, but int eight underscore t. Uh, we'll call it x. Okay. So x is going to be string compare between, I don't know. Let's say tag versus take. Okay. So this will stop. You know when uh, the pointer is pointing to the null terminator here and the lowercase e over here, and then the, it should return a negative value, because tag tak is lexically speaking less than tak take okay? All right, so we just need one more thing, return zero from main, um, and we can now at least test the C code. So gcc-g, <coughs> that's one all, and then we have com uh, string compare.c, uh, it gives us two warnings because the compiler, for whatever reason, is, a, is smart enough to recognize that the function I'm defining has the same name as a built-in, quote-unquote built-in, or a function that is in the library. It's okay. It's not a big deal because you know, it's, it's not linking. 
it, there's no need to link with the system library, I mean, a system string compare subroutine. So I'm still using mine, but the compiler is smart enough to say that, hey, you know, do you really mean to have your own string compare? So that's okay, you know, that's our actual intention, not a problem. Uh, and then the second warning has to do with x as a local variable of main. I put a value into it, I initialize it, but I never really use it for anything else. So the compiler is going like, are you really sure that you want to do this? That you have a local variable, you put something into it, but you never refer to that value later on. Because sometimes it is indic indicative that I have some code that is supposed to use that value, but I'm not, I, I forgot to put that code in. So both of these warnings are okay. You know, we are not having any issues with these warnings. So now it's time to do a GDB and you know, kind of check out this program. When it does run, you know, what is it going to do? So we'll put, a, we'll put a breakpoint at the entry point of string compare so that every time we call the subroutine, it's going to stop so we can look at the parameters. And we'll put a breakpoint in main right at the return statement so that we can check out you know, what value is actually stored in X when it, everything is done. And now we just run the program. This is the first call, okay? The first call to string compare. Nothing really surprising because, you know, um, the, the first string is the entire tag, T-A-K. The second string is T-A-K-E. So, you know, kind of what we expect. We press a C, which is continue. And this is the second call to string compare. And you can see how, you know, the first string is just A-K now because we moved the pointer forward by one character. And then the second string is now A-K-E because the first character are both uppercase T's in both strings. So the logic says, hey, I cannot determine the order at this point, so we'll have to look at the next character determ to determine um, the ordering between these two strings. Then we can continue one more time, and this is going to be the last time, okay? So the last time, the first, the first string, or S1, is uh, displayed as an empty string because it is pointing at a null terminator. So that's why it is displayed as an empty string. The second string st still has one character before the no terminator, so that's why it has a single letter of E, okay? So, but the biggest question now is, what happened to all of those earlier invocations? Are they still somewhere on the stack, or are they already done? You know, what is the deal? So now BT is really helpful, because BT or backtrace allows you to find out um, the entire sequence of subroutine invocations to get to the current point. So this is pretty clear that everything started in main, okay, no big surprise there. Main called string compare, but string compare also called string compare, string compare called string compare, string compare called string compare. Nope, okay, that's it. So, no, call it one more time. So there are one, two, three, there are three, four invocations of string compare at this point. Is that okay? And you can also see each one has its own parameters. The parameters are different for each invocation. They're off by one, but that is as expected. So that means you know, the stack is being used to keep track of not only the return address, but also to keep track of um, the parameters for each invocation. Is that okay? So local variables and parameters are allocated on a per invocation per, um, basis. So that is really kind of important. So at this point, if I continue one more time, it's going to go, it, it will come to a conclusion, and then that return value will just kind of back propagate and will start to undo the stack thing. So if I just continue all the way back to main uh, and look at x, what do you think is going to be in x? One string ended with a null terminator, the other string ended with a lowercase e. So what do you think is going to be in x? It's going to be a negative value, which is also, it's, um, it, how negative is it? It's zero minus the ASCII code of lowercase e. The ASCII code of lowercase e is 97, 98, 99, 100, 101. So when they print it out, it should be negative 101. Okay, so let's check that out. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Okay, 
So what is that thing, uh, the single quarter thing that is next to it, the, the 233? It's auto number. Um, it's the auto representation of negative 101. Does that make sense to you? See, most people would just go like, yeah, we got a negative 101, let's move on, right? No, no, let, let's, let's just pause here and just check out the 233 and see if it makes any sense. So what is 233 in, in octo, okay? In, in decimal, what does it look like? Well, we have three times one, right? That's the least significant three, plus three times eight, which is the middle three, and then plus two times 64, which is the most significant digit, which is the two. And then we come up with 155. Mm, that doesn't sound negative to me. But 155, the bit pattern for that, if you look at it as an 8-bit number and signed, it should represent one, negative 101. How do we know that? Yep, if you apply 2's complement to 155, you will get 101 back as an 8-bit number. So that is how we know the bit pattern of to represent 155, 155 is also the same bit pattern that represents negative 101 when you have an 8-bit signed integer. So are we doing okay so far with that? Okay, so whenever possible, I try to kind of reinforce concepts that we have already learned earlier in the class. Cool, so the program does work, okay? So now we can convert it into assembly. So we'll quit here, and now I'm gonna copy the program, which is called string compare to string compare.ttpasm. You know, that's where the extension or the um, abbreviation comes from in the homework assignment. It stands for Tax Toy Processor Assembly File. So most assembly file ends with .asm, and this one is specific to the processor that we use in this class. So now we look into that file, and then we'll start to implement the code gradually. Oops, uh, colon first. Substitute the beginning of each line with comment and then the space like that. So now we can go ahead and I'm going to move main to the beginning first, you know, just because in assembly we don't really have, well, we do have a way to do this. Okay, so today I'm going to do it in a slightly different way. I'm just do a JMPI to main first. Then we don't have to, you know, switch the order. Okay, that's a cheap way to do it. So we still want to make sure that the stack pointer, you know, starts with a value of zero, which is just one byte past the end of the memory of RAM. To reserve the space for my local variable, we do a decrement D, okay? So we just say this is for allocating for local variable X. And now we have to represent strings, okay? So we never really quite talk about, you know, how to represent strings in assembly. As it turns out, well, there's not, there's no quick and easy way to do it. Um, double quarter strings, double quarter strings in C and C++ are literal strings. So they're basically references to a initialized char array, except you don't need to know the name because you're just referring to the content. But we don't have that ability in assembly. So in assembly, there's no easy way to get around this one. So you know, I'm just gonna have to say, okay, this is tag as a string, and then we have to spell out the bytes you know, in that string. Um, so that's gonna be the first one. It's gonna be the ASCII code of uppercase T, which I'm gonna look up. <laughs> Man, ASCII. So we'll look up all of those characters, you know, just so that we can remember that. So tag is an 84, so let me write it down on a little post-it here. So we got 84, and the lowercase a is 97. And then lowercase k is 107. And then since I have the e with one of those, the e is a 101. There we go. So now I got all the four constants, and we'll just go back to the editor and say, you know, the, the string, the literal string that has only tag, T-A-K, is going to be a byte with 84 as a decimal number, another byte with 97, another byte with 107, that's tag. And then we also have a byte with zero because that's the null terminator. 
And then we have the other string, the, the other literal string, take, is going to be about the same. Okay, so we got 84, um, 97, 107. And then this time we also have a lowercase e, which is 101, and then the null terminator. So this is basically what is happening behind the scene when you use a double quote string in C. This is all happening with the compiler. The compiler is taking care of this for you so that you don't really need to refer to these you know, labels and go like, oh, I'm referring to that label or this label. You just have to put the string definition in place. You know, so to, to you, it is really kind of cool and convenient. But behind the scene, the compiler is actually doing the same thing that I'm doing right now. Is that OK? All right. <clears throat> OK. So assuming that part is OK, we just kind of go back here and then say, OK, now we need to push the arguments. OK. We have to finish up the right-hand side of the assignment before we do the left-hand side. So we have to push the address of the literal string take. But in this case, since we already have a label for that particular string, so we just have to say, you know, take string, you know, load it into A, decrement D to reserve you know, room for that address, and then push it on the stack or store that to where the stack pointer points to. So this is really the same thing as pushing the string take on the stack. On the stack, LDIA with tag string, decrement D, store to the stack pointer. Now we are pushing the string, which is the address of the array on the stack, like that. And then the next thing we need to do is to store, uh, push the return address. So we'll say this is a main return from string compare. We'll define that label later. Document D, store, and then this is push the return address on the stack. With everything pushed, now we can continue execu execution in the string function. So we just have to string compare function. So we jump to string compare. And then the label, the return label is going to be defined here, main return from string compare. Put it here. Increment D, increment D to deallocate the two arguments that are now on the stack, but they're useless at this point. So we are deallocating arguments on the stack. So at this point, the stack pointer should be balanced. In other words, what do you think register D should be pointing at at this moment? Yep, the local variable X, which is really handy because register A has the return value, and then register D is pointing to the variable that I need to access. So we just need a STDA over here. So now X equals to string compare blah, 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 like so. Okay, so the return zero is uh, the deallocation of the local variable because you know we are now at the very end of the entire main subroutine. Um, so the local variable is of no use to us anymore. So now we deallocate the local variable. And typically we will have those three instructions to um, return to the caller. But main has no caller in this case. It cannot go back to the command line interface. It cannot go back to code blocks. There's nothing to go back to. So we use a halt instruction to say that, OK, we're done. Are we doing OK so far with this code? So far. OK? So this is main, which is the caller. Yes? So um, I'm kind of confused about the string. So uh -huh. we just like define like the ASCII byte or whatever. Mm -hmm. We are pushing the address of the first byte of those chars, a uh, char array. Okay, so we have uh, the array stored somewhere else? Yeah, which in this case is it's at the end of the opcodes. And that's, that has to do with you know, how, where I put it, like that. It's a char array. Yeah. yeah. So these are basically global char arrays that I define, and then the label is utilized when I push. So what I'm pushing is the address, not the content on the stack. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Now the other way to look at this, you know, to from the C perspective is we can I, I can actually do the same thing in the C program, even though it is not necessary. 
But in order to understand you know, how the literal strings are actually implemented, I can do it here. So I can do an extern um, uh, cons char pointer um, text string, extern cons char take string. Okay. So the word extern is basically saying, um, we don't know who's going to define it, but somebody's going to do it. Okay, so it's basically a, um, how do you call it, those things in a, in a movie, you know, it's, it's foretelling that, you know, the definition is going to be somewhere, okay? So it, it's convincing the C compiler, one, it is safe to use these names, and two, the types associated with those names, okay? So with those names, you know, defined, I can now, you know, take away this thing here. Um, so we have tag string here, and then we have take string here. And then at the very end, you know, I'm, I'm preserving the order of everything, so that's why I'm doing it in this particular way. So over here, we can now say uh, const char array, um, oops, const char tag string equals to, um, because I'm using an array, so I'm using, I'm, this is as truthful as possible to the assembly code. Okay, and then we have const char take string, which is going to be T A K E and a no character. So with the no character, it is okay to use a quote backslash zero as well. You know that's another way to denote the no character. Yep. Mm, no, because uh, because these are global variables. They're statically allocated, so they're not on the stack at all. So let's say if you wanted variables, you would make changes to Oh, okay, yes. So if you want it to be a local variable and you want to be able to make changes to it, then you have to put it on the stack. So be initial, you'll be initializing um, characters on the stack, but you have to remember that you have to initialize it backwards. Because you'll be pushing the zero first, so you'll be pushing, you'll be pushing this zero and then the k and then the a and then the t, because um, because whatever you push first, it has a higher address, and we want the null terminator to be the highest, to have the highest address. So it could do it that way too. But in the C code, we were using a literal string, and literal strings are allocated in a static way, and they are basically global variables. They have no name, so you cannot refer to the name, but you can refer to the content. So in this way, you know, the C program does reflect the assembly code, and this is the long hand of using a literal string, which nobody does because there's no way. Why would you want to refer to a name and then later on define the name when you can just say double quote, blah, 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 right? But they're equivalent in terms of you know, the function of the program. So before I go any further, I need to double check and make sure, oh, it doesn't like it. Okay, so why is it doesn't access element in scalar initializer? Oh, okay, I, I see. I forgot to, uh, I forgot to use um, brackets. So it thinks the you know, text string and text string are uh, constars, but they are actually arrays of constars, so that's why. There we go, still doesn't like it. Um, conflicting types, because one is a pointer, the other one is an array, I think. That's why it's, they're complaining. It's just being very specific about that. Yep, there we go. So are we good so far with this? All right. <clears throat> I think some of you are going to take a, a class in compiler implementation, so you will get all this, all of this again. Yeah, you know, when you take that class. And we are working on the assembly code, TTPASM. So now we can focus on string compare, which is basically you know what we really want to do, and. 
the way I usually implement, I, that I would go about implementing a uh, subroutine in assembly is I want to remind myself of what is on the stack. So we got S2 at the highest address, S1 right below that, and then the return address right below that, and then register D is pointing to the return address. I always want to have a map like this to remind myself what is on the stack at that point. Okay. All right, so now we need to uh, first implement, you know, um, the comparison between what S2 points to versus what S1 is pointing to. So this is going to be a little bit tedious. Um, one thing we can do, let me see, can we do it? Do we have enough registers to do it? We are just short of one register to do it. Um, what I'm thinking is, you know, can we use one register to store S1 and another register to store S2? But that's not going to do us any good because we, in order to do the compare CMP, we need to put the characters being compared into registers too. And we only got four registers. I cannot use register D, so we are just one register short to use that approach. So it's going to be a little bit tedious now. <clears throat> All right, so we'll do, a, we'll do a CPR CD so that, you know, so I always want to put comments here to know what is C. So at this point, C is the return, the address of the return address. Increment C, C is now the, the address of S1, which is a pointer. Um, that is not what I want, so I'm going to do a D reference. So we'll do a LDBC, so that C is, oops, B is actually S1, which is a pointer, but I'm not comparing the pointer, I'm, I'm comparing what the pointer points to. So I need to do another LD into possibly the same register, okay? So now B is whatever S1 points to, and then we can increment C. I never touch C you know, in this whole process. So by incrementing C, C is now the address of S2. And then we do the same trick, but this time use register A. Hmm. I'm going to flip the registers. This is A, this is B. Okay, come on, B. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to put this into register B. I'm just, you know, and flip the description too. Uh, put the, uh, huh? Oh, okay, thank you. Yep, forgot to fix that. Okay. And the reason why I do this flip is I need to get the registers into the right order so that when I do the compare, I'm actually not going to do the compare. I'm doing subtract. Okay, so, so stay tuned, stay tuned. Okay, so at this point, you know, I got the two bytes that I need to compare in register A and register B. Register A has what S1 points to, register B has what S2 points to, okay? So in the original C code, I am doing a comparison, a CMP, okay? Or what is equivalent to a CMP in assembly code. But then I look at the code and go like, hey, eventually, you know, we need to refer to the result of the subtraction, or there's at least a potential that I need to do that. So I might as well just store, to, just to do the actual subtraction so that the difference is computed and put it into register A, okay? Because there's a, there's a chance that that is what I need to return. Does that make any sense? Okay, so we'll do a actual subtraction instead of a compare. So you kind of have to pay attention here and say that um, tag is short cutting the program, okay, because I'm not following the exact C code because I can do better in assembly. Okay, so after the subtraction, I still have to do the branch because, you know, I might be done, I may not be done. So now I need to ask the question, am I done? Okay, so when they are different, I know for sure that I'm done, right? So I need to do something like this because I do not have a JNZ, you know, jump if not zero. So I'm going to do a JZI to jump around this, okay? So we'll just uh, call this, you know, um, I don't know, um, around one. Oh, okay, same is fine, okay. And then same is defined right here. So that means if I do it here, it is not the same. Does that make any sense? 
So over here, I will just go to the point where I do not perform a recursion. Okay, so we say no recursion. Okay, we'll define that label, you know, somewhere else. Okay, so if we end up here, that means A and B are the same, and I have zero stored in A at this point. But not all hope is gone. Okay, you know, maybe I don't even need recursion at this point because if A, um, if B is a zero, then I know I don't have to do a single thing. I cannot check A anymore. A is guaranteed a zero at this point. So I cannot use A and say, oh, is S1 pointing to a dull character? I can't do that anymore because I just destroyed it. And I know for sure that A is a zero because otherwise I would have gone to no recursion. So A is guaranteed to have a zero, but it has nothing to do with what, what uh, S1 and S2 are pointing to. But I, but I, st I still have B. B still has the character that S2 is pointing to, so I can rely on that. So now we can uh, check out B and see whether we still need to do recursion or not. So th the way to do it, or the easy way to do it, is to do it and BB. So instead of loading um, another register with a zero, which A already has, okay, and then do a compare, I can just do it and BB. Is that okay? Because I just need to know whether it's zero or not. That's all I need. If it is a zero, that means I have hit the end of string for both strings, which means, hey, I don't need to do any recursion anymore. So I need to go to no recursion here as well. OK, no recursion. Did I did? Nope, hey, that's correct. All right, so this is the only time I need to do recursion. OK, do recursion here because um, these two are the same, and that is not zero. Okay, to be more exact, it is S2 that we know is not a zero, but it implies that S1 is not a zero either. Are we still doing okay so far with this code? Okay. <coughs> so now we are ready to do the recursion. The recursion is just you know passing whatever S1 has plus one, and then pass whatever S2 has plus one. So I'm not going to do um, a trick t of a tail end recursion. So I'm actually going to do the recursion here. A tail end recursion is possible in assembly because you know I can just uh, change what is on the stack, the parameters themselves, and then go back to the label so that we so it be, it basically becomes a loop instead of a subroutine call. But I'm not going to do that you know because the whole point is to understand how to do subroutine calls. <coughs> Register C is still pointing to S2, which is kind of handy because I can use it again. So we'll do another LD. Um, this time I can use A or B. It doesn't really matter which one. So, so the A is now um, S2 again. And this time I don't want to dereference A any further because I need to pass a pointer on the stack. But I do need to increment it first. So A is now S2 plus 1. And now we can push it on the stack. Decrement D. STDA. So we are basically pushing S2 plus 1 on the stack. Um, we decrement C and then do another LDAC. So now the A now A is S1. Increment A. So the A is S1 plus 1. Decrement D STDA. So we are pushing S1 plus 1 on the stack. Now we just need to push the return address. So we do a LDI A with um, string compare return from string compare. Uh, decrement D, reserve the space, store the return address on the stack, push return address on the stack. Then we do another JMPI to string compare. This is the actual recursive call here to tr continue execution in the subroutine. And now we can define string compare, return from string compare, clean up the stack, increment D, increment D, uh, clean up after the arguments. And at this point, um, register A will have the return value from the recursive call, but that's going to be my return value as well, so I don't have to do any single thing here. So I can just do a JMPI to my actual return code, okay, 
to return label, and that's done. So the only thing left here is to specify what do I need to do in no recursion. And what do you think I need to do at the label of no recursion, which is supposed to compute star S1 minus star S2 and put it into register A? Absolutely. That means we don't have to do a single thing here. <laughs> but if you insist and say, but we need something at the branch, fine. Are you happier now? <laughs> <laughs> Just to emphasize that there's nothing we need to do. So this has to do with, so the, the trick that I did in order to simplify the program a whole lot and save ourselves from a lot of unnecessary dereferencing and whatnot because we don't really have all the register to do all that, is I carry out an actual subtraction instead of a compare. Okay? Now, that saves us a lot of trouble for several reasons. So let's go back to the C code because I just want to explain how that works again. Okay, so this is a comparison in C. This is also another comparison. And then there's, um, I don't need to do, well, okay, this comparison, you know, is one comparison. But after the comparison, we might just need to refer to the result of the subtraction. So I might as well just do the subtraction and say, well, if that is good enough as a return value, we got it. But the actual subtraction instruction will change the flags the same way as a compare instruction. So we can use the flags as well for conditional branching. So we are basically you know, doing two things at the same time, computing the result and setting the flags so that we can do the conditional branching at the same time. So that is what saves us a lot of unnecessary code compared to the actual you know, C version. So after this, we can now you know, specify what we should do at return. And that's the usual things. You know, we do LD um, B from D to retrieve the return address on the stack. And then we do a increment D to deallocate the return address and then the JMPB to continue execution in the caller. And that's it. That's the whole implementation of string compare. Maybe. So do, do you guys think it's going to work? <clears throat> well, okay, let me, let me rephrase that question. Did you catch me uh, making any mistake you know, in this code? Okay, very good. So that means you guys have been following. That's good. That's a good sign. Was it boring? Okay, that's a good sign too, because if it's boring, that means you already know what I'm doing. It's just mechanically, it is tedious. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll do a mouse pad string compare.ttpasm because I need to copy and paste it. So control A, control C, switch back to the browser, and then go to my. Google document. So that's going to be apps, not lost reels. Go to Google Drive. I need a shortcut to that. Okay. And shared processor assembler. There we go. So we need to paste that code. Now you guys are smart. You are there before I am there. <laughs> okay, heads up. We are trying to edit parts of this sheet that shouldn't be changed accidentally. Okay, let's not do that. Because I'm supposed to only change one place. Why would it want to warn me about that? Hmm. Yeah, it's the tabs, yep. So that means I need to remove all the tab characters. Well, I can do it here too. I can just search and replace. Okay, where's the dialog box? 
Where did he go? Okay, search, find and replace, control R, there we go. So we are searching for, okay, does it understand tap? Nope, nope, hmm. Nope, doesn't know that. And if I use the actual tab character, it switches. Okay, we'll do it in in BI. Replace all tab characters with space space. Okay, so we got 29 tab characters. Okay, they're all replaced. Do another mouse pad. Okay, where is, where's the mouse pad? Okay. Switch back to the assembler. Let's paste it again. Yep, okay, that works. So, so the bottom line is, if the spreadsheet warns you about, oh, are you really sure that you want to overwrite some portions of the document? Just say no, and then look for the tab characters. All right, so now we go to RAM file, file, um, download as, CSV, and we'll call this CM, uh, string compare, CSV, and then we can now switch back to, or start, logic sim, okay. Now, I'm hoping the program is not going to work. Then I can show you guys how to debug a program because that's actually important. <clears throat> All right, so load the program in. String compare.csv. There we go. All right. So I will log a bunch of stuff, okay, just in case it doesn't work, you know, I have some log to go with already. <clears throat> we'll do the usual stuff, you know, the program counter. Um, change weight X like that. Uh, register D is always important because it is our stack pointer. So register D. And then we also need a bunch of RAM locations. So now the question is how many RAM locations am I gonna need? in order to um, debug this program, potentially. How many locations should I be logging? So the, the, okay, so let's try to answer that question. We know that location 255 is gonna be used by the local variable x of main, okay? So that's 255. Each invocation of string compare needs how many bytes? It has two arguments and then the return address, so three bytes altogether. The recursive call is gonna happen four times, well, okay, I shouldn't say the recursive, but string compare is gonna be called four times altogether. So it's four times three, which is 12 bytes, plus the one, 13 bytes. So I'm gonna log, um, 14 bytes, just one more than what we think it's gonna use. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That should be our last one, but just in case, we're gonna have that one too. Okay? I'm too lazy to change the radix, so we'll keep it as base two. <laughs> I think we at this time we can convert base two and base sixteen at least, you know, pretty quickly. <clears throat> and we'll keep everything in the file, okay? So we'll log it to um, string compare.tsv, and now we can start clocking. Okay, control K, and this time it takes a little bit longer now because you know because of recursive, um, the recursive nature. Okay, so being lazy as I am, I'm gonna check RAM first to see whether I got the right answer because if we got the right answer, the stack is balanced. That means you know, I don't really have to log into the log file. So right click, 
go to load, oops, edit cont content. And we got a 9B here. So do you think 9B is the right answer? Because we manually calculated the answer. It is um, 0 minus the ASCII code of lowercase e. Lowercase e is 90, 101, sorry. It's not 101. So the 2's complement of 101 as an 8-bit number turned out to be 155, I think. Okay. So I know this one is at least, um, at first glance, it is not wrong. In other words, I can see that the, the sign bit is a 1. It is, it's a negative value. Is that okay? So we are looking at 128 plus something. So if you subtract 128 from 155, what do you get? 20, huh? Okay, 155 minus 128. So it'd be 27, right? Okay. So the question now is 1B representing 27. So the 1 is 16, so 27 minus 16 is 11. So now the question is B as a digit in base 16, does it represent 11? And that is the case. So we do get the right result back. Okay, so that's, that's a good sign. And then the next thing we need to check is, okay, it left it behind a trail of stuff on the stack. That's only because we don't have any interrupts in this processor, because otherwise I cannot count on anything that a stack pointer that is below where the stack pointer points to, which at this point is every single byte on the stack. But since we know there are no interrupts, we can now kind of go back in time and go like, okay, does that make sense? What is on the stack? Do they make sense? 413D, those are the original pointers. Okay, you know, the, the two strings. And we should see 4, 2, 3D to increment, um, increment, and then increment one more time. Okay, so that's good because we start with the original string and then for each uh, recursive call, we add one to the pointer. So we are seeing that progression just fine. The, this byte here is the return address to main. Um, and then all the subsequent ones are the return address back to the, string compare itself. So if I were to look up the assembler, I should find, um, I should find 38 to correspond to main return from string compare, and I should find 21 to be the label of string compare return from string compare. Is that making any sense? Sort of, maybe, okay. So instead of saying if, you know, I'm gonna do it. So we go to the assemble tab, um, and you can always scroll a little bit, you know, just so that it's easier to see those things. So we are looking for the definition of the labels, and here we have the label definition corresponding to string compare return from string compare. It is indeed 2-1 in hexadecimal, so that's good. Um, and then we look into main, which also has its own return label which is this one, it is 3.8 in hexadecimal, and I think that matches what we saw earlier. So everything pointed to the direction that the program did execute correctly. The stack should be balanced, so that's one more thing that we can check, is whether register D, the stack pointer, is back to where it is supposed to be, which is 0.0, zero because we are done. We deallocated everything, including the local variable x. So register D is 0.0, zero at this point, which is at the end of the entire program, so the whole thing checks out. Are there any questions? It is kind of unfortunate because the program is, does work. <laughs> I was hoping the program doesn't work because I missed something, then I can go back to the trace and try to figure out you know, why it is not working, but it does. <laughs> Sorry? Yep. <laughs> but I'm, can, I'm, I'm used to this kind of thing because I used to go to programming contests. So I'm used to, you know, like, you know, just given the problem and then try to solve it on the spot. Um, for those of you who transfer, who are transferring, you know, soon to a four-year university, consider joining the ACM, local chapter of the ACM, um, and then participate in the programming contests. It is very stressful, okay, but it's also a lot of fun. It really helps you to kind of understand, you know, the, the work environment to a certain extent. Um, <laughs> I see a lot of nodding here. 
Um, and it's kind of fun too. It depends on you know whether you consider it stressful or just kind of fun, you know, because you know you go there, you know, your grade is not going to be affected if you cannot finish all the problems. But you can kind of see how maybe you compare to your peers, um, and if you like solving problems, it's just kind of the fun of you know, solving problems too. Yep. Yeah, but if you actually win the uh, local chapter ACM programming contest, then you will be representing your school to go to a regional contest. Um, I went to one and it was really fun because you see all the other schools, you know, and they have their teams, and then each team is given like a set of problems, like you know, six or seven. So you're supposed to write programs to solve those problems, you know, on the spot um, in the time that's allocated. Um, if at least one team can finish all the problems, then it's you know, whatever team that can finish all the problems first. But if no team can finish all the problems, then they will count how many problems are solved by each team and how much time it takes and so on and so forth. So it's actually kind of interesting. You know, I would you know, do it at least once, okay, just to get the experience. All right. So do we have any questions about this program? No questions? Okay, so in the discussion earlier with one of your you know, classmates, um, we were talking about a way to debug your program. And you, know, you guys know how you can insert a halt instruction in your, in your code so that the program will stop with a halt instruction. But then the problem is, what if I want to continue because you know, everything looks right at the halt instruction, I just want to kind of move on. Okay, so let's kind of think about that a little bit. Okay. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to reset the processor. So I'm hitting a reset here. But I also have to make sure the clock is a low state at this point. In other words, I'm going to rerun this particular program. But I'm going to manually insert, quote unquote, a breakpoint. Okay. Now this is you know, basically a debugging technique. Um, this is also how GDB works. When you want to insert a breakpoint in GDB, this is kind kind of you know how the way the way it works. So what we would need to do now is to figure out okay where do we want to insert a breakpoint. Um, so let's say we want to insert a breakpoint at the entry point of the subroutine string compare. So that is going to correspond to this location, which is uh, zero three. Okay. So what you need to do um, is to remember what is what was at location zero three. It's a five B. So the assembler does help you to, to remember what was there to begin with. <clears throat> and then in uh, Logisim, what I'm going to do is to go to that location, 0B, uh, excuse me, 03, uh, which is right here, which had a content of 5B. Now, the other thing you can also do is to save it and restore it later on. That works too. But you know, since it's just one byte, I'm just going to put a 0 1 here. Okay, I'm just you know, doctoring the content of RAM and change that one byte from 5.3 to 0.1. In other words, I'm replacing a particular opcode with a halt instruction. So if I run this program with control K, the program will run all the way up to the entry point of the subroutine string compare and then it will stop. Okay? So let's do that. Uh, switch to this part, control K, and it has stopped. Okay, so I'm going to do another control K to stop the automated uh, clocking, and I need to check a few things. So I need to check uh, where's the program counter. The program counter is at 04, which is not right because it is the following instruction. So we can we can fix that later. So at this point, you know, I can do something. I can look into the register bank. Okay, the stack pointer is FC. Okay, cool, and then we can look into RAM check out what is on the stack down to FC. So we look at um, the content and go like, okay, you know, FC is right here, okay? Uh, no, right here. So we, we just push the 3.8 on the stack, okay, when we transfer to the subroutine, which makes sense because 3.8 is our return address. So everything looks good. I want to continue the execution of the program. So now the question is, do we have to reassemble the whole program, reload the whole thing to, in order to continue the execution of the program? The answer is no, okay? But you do have to know what you're doing in order to quote unquote continue execution past um, a breakpoint. First thing first, go to the location and restore the byte. 
It was a 5B here. Now we change it back to a 5B. But that is at location 0, 3. The program counter has already gone past that point. So now we have to go to um, the program counter and dock to that so that it points back to location 0, 3. And then one more thing. <clears throat> the microcode is not is stuck at location 0, 1, 0 because you know, we just executed the halt instruction. So we have to reset it. And to reset this, there are several ways to do it. The easiest way is just to do this. You basically dock to the microcode pointer, so now it's back to location 0, 0, 0 in the ROM. Okay? This is ROM, not RAM. Um, and then the only thing left that, you, that we have to be really careful about is the clock. So we, I should have done that before I you know, reset this. So we have to reset the clock back to a um, low state. Oh, oh, why is it not changing? Oh, because this is not the, uh, the pin that can change it. So I have to reset the clock back to a low state. But then I have to be careful here because I need to make sure that the micro code pointer is back to location 0, 0, 0. So now we can continue the execution of the program. <clears throat> now, you probably want to put a breakpoint somewhere else, okay? You know, because you, know, you want to stop the program again and check, okay, is it doing it right here? But that entire sequence of things is what GDB does. So when you set a breakpoint, GDB is replacing the first opcode of that address with a single byte that is going to cause GDB to get control. Okay? When you resume execution by see, saying a C or a single step or something like that, uh, GDB is replacing that one byte that represents a breakpoint to, with the original instruction so that it can continue execution at that point. <clears throat> there are some hardware tricks in some processors so that you don't have to actually change the locations and whatnot. Some processors have um, internal support for breakpoints. Um, the x86 may be one of those processors, actually. But there are other processors that do not have that you know, ability. Then you have to use this trick to set breakpoints. So that's just you know, a technique that you can use to kind of you know, help debug your programs. So are there any questions about this program? Conceptually, what we're doing on the stack, how recursion occurs, um, how we utilize you know, the referencing, referencing, and that sort of thing. Are there any questions? Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. So if there are no questions about this, we have 10 minutes. Let me see if I have enough time to uh, crack my own program. I don't think I have it here. Let me just double check. Do I have that in my files? Not. Let's see if Moodle is still up. It is still up. Okay. My uh, certificate is uh, outdated. That's why. So we'll go to proceed. Yeah, yeah, it's unsafe. I actually told the IT people that they can turn off the uh, port 80 and 443, so that you know, the web interface is not accessible anymore. Um, can't I just do this once and for all? In Chrome? Okay. I know in Firefox how to do it, but Chrome doesn't seem to be as easy. You showed me when you could theoretically. Okay. So I have a better way to do it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yep. No, the other one does the redirect. That's fine. OK. But did I go to? I didn't go to the class. It, it bounced me off. 
Okay, do it one more time. It doesn't give me the uh, the option and go like, okay, let's just add that certificate. I guess they want to be safe. That was Moodle. Okay, so let's check this out. Oh, right, right there. Okay, crack this 64-bit Linux program. That's it. That's what I want. Just a few more times, and we'll get it. Okay, so that's the executable. Save. Good. Okay, now we're done. All right. So on to cracking this program. On to you know, like some, some hacking. Low level, you know, this is actually entry level type of hacking. Um, so, Shamad U plus X, you know, we are converting this to executable. So, normally, you know, this is completely questionable because one, I'm ignoring the warning of the browser um, that, you know, I'm, I don't have a secure connection. Two, I downloaded an executable. And three, I changed the permission to, yeah, let's go execute this program. Okay. So normally this is a totally terrible idea to do something like this, but since I know what I'm doing, in quotes, so it's okay. All right, so I'm gonna run this program. <clears throat> okay, where is it? It should be here. Uh, I changed the, yep, there we go. Okay, so I'm running this program. It's, it's waiting for a password. So I'm typing a password here, press the enter key, and it says, you know, read the fine uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act because I'm trying to circumvent the copy protection mechanism of this program. Okay, so what am I going to do with this program? I need to hack it, okay? So in other words, you know, this program has a conditional statement that says, you know, if the password doesn't match, then it will display this message instead of letting me through and utilize the rest of the program. So but now the question is, how am I going to crack this program? If the program is properly written, there should be no way for me to crack the program. Yep. <coughs> Say that one more time. Yes. But sometimes you know, the, the code may not be calling the C library instead of, you know, instead it's using its own subroutine. So what I'm going to do is to try a password that is long and longer and even longer and see if it crashes, okay? So I'm gonna run the program again. And you know, this is not the best way to do it because you, know, you can never really remember what you type. So the best way to do it in this particular situation is I'm just gonna define the password file, okay? And in the fa password file, I'm just gonna have a certain pattern, okay? And I'm gonna repeat it several times. So we'll do a... Uh, To do it again now. Okay, so you just have to repeat it a few times and until you think that you might overflow the stack. Okay, so we'll just you know say okay maybe that's enough maybe that's not enough. So we redirect the password file into the program, and we have a segmentation fault. Great, this is good news. Okay, because the reason why it's going to give me a segmentation fault instead of saying you know, RTF DMCA is because the program cannot, did not anticipate the password to be this long. And it's overflowing something, causing the program to crash. Is that okay? Crashing, in quotes, is basically the program going to a certain location that it's not supposed to go and it cannot execute the code over there. Is that okay? So what I need to do now is to run the program again, but this time in GDB. So I'm using GDB as a tool to hack the program. So I'm going to go here, and then I will. I can redirect the same file in when I run it from GDB, and it's going to crash the same time, okay, the same way. But this time, I get some clues, okay. I can see where it's crashing, okay. It's crashing at a certain location, um, but I also have access to the stack. So I can do an IR, I think it's RSP, just, you know, that's the stack pointer. And I want to know what is on the stack at this point, because I know the program is crashing because 
it's ran out of stuff on the stack, or it is some part of the stack is not what it is supposed to have. Okay, so I can use the x command to kind of print out what is on the stack. So let's say I just want to print 30, uh, 20 something. Let's print a little bit more. Let's print um, a thousand. Okay, a thousand bytes each one. I want to print in hexadecimal. In that's what the x is, and then we just you know specify the same number. Okay, I can just double click and paste it here. Okay, well, do you think you know it should have these bytes on the stack? We having do do you see a pattern? First of all, do you see a repeating pattern? I see a repeating pattern. Um, what is the period of the repeating pattern? In other words, how many bytes before it repeats itself? Well, it's easy to tell because every two lines is the same, like that. So every 16 bytes, it repeats. Then you look into the actual you know, value. What is three zero in hexadecimal? Is that that sounds like an ASCII code to you, right? Because if it is more than 27 in decimal and less than 128 in decimal, it's printable, okay? So 30 turns out to be the ASCII code of zero. Um, okay, so we got zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to eight, nine. And what do you think is six one in hexadecimal? It's lowercase a. Oh, okay. So it, we filled up the stack with you know, stuff you know, that is coming from the standard in. Okay? So the other thing that we need to do now, we probably won't have enough time to actually go through the entire thing, is, um, is to figure out which location is actually responsible to cause it to crash. Okay? One of these things is responsible. We don't know exactly which one. Is that okay? Um, we can also look at the RIP uh, RIP um, register. IP stands for instruction pointer, which is the Intel's terminology for program counter. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. It we want to print dollar. Okay. Because it's a special name. Uh, it's 40059B. Um, so the program is recording the last location where it had a problem with, not the location where it was branching to. So it's not telling me you know, which return address is um, involved here. We are running out of time. So what I need to do now is to find out which bytes is responsible for this crash. Now, there are two ways to do this. You can always change the size of your file. So you basically make it smaller and smaller and smaller until it doesn't crash anymore. Then you can locate, you know exactly which four or which eight bytes is causing it to crash. So with control over those eight bytes, then we can potentially we uh, ch intentionally change those eight bytes so that it returns to a location that it's not supposed to return to. So this kind of connects to, remember I showed you some programs that I said, you know, if you only know about C and C++ programming, you wouldn't be able to debug those programs. Do you guys remember that? I'm exploiting that. I'm intentionally putting something on the stack so that I will return to a particular location in the program. I also need to find out where I want it to go to. In other words, I need to disassemble the program to find out, oh, okay, this is the branch corresponding to the password not matching. This is the branch corresponding to the password matching. So I need to re change the return address to the branch that, match that says, oh, yes, everything matches and it's all good. We won't have enough time today to do all that, but this is the beginning, okay? So at least I caused the program to crash, there is hope to crash, to, to, uh, to hack this program now. Is that okay? So we'll, we'll continue with this next time um, because, you know, I do want to show you guys how to do this. It's kind of, kind of fun. <clears throat> All right. So for the second lab, people, if you're done with your homework assignment already, you know, the um, swap subroutine, there's no need to show up in the stack, uh, in the stack, in the lab. <laughs> 
On the other hand, if you're still working on it, then I'll be over at the lab. You know, if you have questions to ask, you know, I'll be there to answer your question.